Okay, AP Physics 2, it is time to start Unit 6, Light and Optics. Optics being the study of the behavior and properties of light. Now, we're going to see that although light is very ubiquitous, it's around us pretty much all the time, that is actually an accumulation of all the physics we've learned over the past few units. But before we start getting too much into light itself, we're going to have to actually take a bit of a detour. And the reason why that is, is that to understand light, we really need to be able to understand waves and many, many different aspects of waves. So we're going to actually pause light for a minute and right now focus on mechanical waves. And specifically, this video is going to focus on types of these waves and their properties. So what is a wave exactly? Well, let's go ahead and get a little bit of a scenario here and kind of follow it through and see what we can figure out from it. So let's say this is like a bathtub and we've got like a faucet here that seems to be a little bit leaky and we have like a rubber ducky over here on the side and a drop of water is going to fall from this leaky faucet and it's going to land in the water. And when it does, this creates a ripple and we've all seen this before and this ripple will start expanding outward from this point. But when it hits the rubber ducky, what you will see happen is this ripple actually causes the rubber ducky to basically move probably up and down, which might seem a little surprising because the water droplet was applied at a different position. It's not like it directly hit the duck. So something has happened here to transfer this movement to the duck itself. And what that is specifically in this situation is something known as a wave pulse, an individual piece of a continuous wave. Now let's say that the faucet is instead leaking at a nice periodic regular rate. Well, instead of having a single wave pulse, a single ripple, we're now going to have a continuous wave propagating outward that's going to cause the duct to go up and down continually. And this Basically, piece here going from the water droplet to the rubber ducky is what we call a wave, a traveling disturbance created by some source that transfers energy and momentum through space. Now, the source here is the water droplets hitting the surface of the water. And this wave transfers energy and momentum from the source to the duck, causing the duck to move up and downward. Now, this is specifically an example of what is known as a mechanical wave, meaning that it requires a medium to propagate. Now, propagate is a word you're probably not overly familiar with, but you see it a lot with waves. This really means move through or develop, for instance. So the mechanical wave requires a substance, something, to basically transfer this wave through it, allow the wave to continually move from one point to another. In this particular situation, that medium would be water. It could be air. It just has to be some sort of material. Now, I want to quickly note that you've definitely seen ripples drawn in this way or waves drawn in this way. And these right here are something known as wave fronts. And that front is going to be basically like the maximum point of the wave. Because realistically, if you were to basically turn this image, rather than look at it from overhead, but instead kind of look at it more head on, you would see that this water is kind of bobbing in and out as these ripples go through. Now, this is much, much harder to draw, but it does give us a lot of good detail. So we're actually going to focus in specifically. We're going to say, okay, let's take out this little cutout here, and we're going to look at this wave motion as it travels, in this instance, to the right. And these dotted line here would be like, for instance, the surface of the water when it is undisturbed. So let's look at a somewhat analogous situation. Let's say that you are holding the end of a string that's tied to some object really, really far away. And these two red X's are just showing you two particular points in the string. What you're going to do is you're going to basically quickly move your hand upward and downward continually. And what you will see is that this wave pattern will start to emerge in the string. And as time goes on, this will continue to develop to the right. But what I want you to notice is that these red points here, like so the these red dots, they don't move position. They stay where they're located, but the whole wave itself is definitely moving in the rightward direction. Now, this is something known as a transverse wave. This is a particular type of mechanical wave type. And a transverse wave is one in which the displacement of the medium is perpendicular to the direction of wave propagation. Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, here we have, for instance, that the wave is propagating or moving through the string to the right. 
And additionally, we have that these points on the string are moving up and down as the wave goes through it, but they aren't moving with the wave. So they're moving up and down as the wave moves to the right. So they're moving perpendicular to the direction that the wave is traveling. And notice that I said they don't move with the wave to the right. And this is very, very key. Energy and momentum are transferred through this medium. So in other words, if I looked at a point over here, for instance, it would not initially experience the wave until the wave reached it, but then it is gaining energy and momentum from what you are doing over here, holding the end of the string. But matter in the string is not transferred. It's not like the piece of string you're holding magically appears over there. So we're moving energy and momentum, but not matter. The matter is, in fact, staying in the same relative position. It's moving around what we call an equilibrium position, which is this basically point where, if there is no wave, where it would be sitting, but its relative position is staying the same. Now, a couple of terminology things here. We call the top of these a crest, and we call the bottom of these a trough. Additionally, transverse waves, as we see here, a really good example would be waves on a string or a rope. You can also probably think of water waves. Water waves are actually a little bit more complicated, but they also exhibit a somewhat similar behavior. Now let's look at a very different type of mechanical wave. And let's say right here that we've got like, for instance, we'll say this is a bunch of like gas particles here. And this red X marks this position of one particular gas particle. And we are gonna say that you're like holding something that's pressed against these particles. And let's go ahead and say that when we start, we're gonna actually have you move your hand in and out rather than up and down. So you're gonna move it in and out, and that's gonna cause these gas particles to basically compress and then spread back out when you move your hand back. And this is gonna continue traveling to the right through space in something that is known as a longitudinal wave, otherwise known as a pressure wave. And this is one in which the displacement of the medium is parallel to the direction of the wave propagation. Now, what we mean by parallel is that one molecule of gas here it is going to travel back and forth in the same direction that the wave is going, but it's going to maintain its relative position once again. We're transferring energy and momentum, but actually not very much matter. The matter is going to stay relatively in the same place. Now, we don't have crests or troughs anymore. What we usually have are what are called compressions. This would be where the pressure is the highest. And we have rarefactions, which is where the pressure is the lowest. And a quintessential example of these types of waves are sound waves. This is, in fact, how sound travels through space. We make a noise, and when we do that, we create a vibration that basically creates these compressions and rarefactions that then go outward through space as the wave travels away from this source. Now you'll notice here, this is really hard to draw. And so really, we don't actually see most sound waves or most longitudinal waves represented this way. Instead, what we usually do is we essentially make them look like transverse waves when we're trying to plot their shape, because transverse waves are just much, much easier to draw. But when we're doing that, we're not actually showing the position of the particles with respect to you know, some horizontal position. We're not showing vertical versus horizontal. Instead, what we're showing is the pressure in that particular point versus the horizontal position. So for instance, if I'm looking from here to here, we would have, okay, this is the compression, rarefaction would be right here, compression, rarefaction. So we're seeing this change in pressure, and that's just a lot easier to draw and a lot easier to mathematically analyze. Well, now that we've talked about the types of mechanical waves, let's focus on their properties. And we're really going to be looking primarily at transverse waves, because once again, one, they're way easier to analyze, and two, really most of the ways we're going to be dealing with are of this type. All right, so let's kind of go through some of these. The first one we're going to say is the frequency, which we abbreviate with a lowercase f, which is the number of waves that are generated per unit time, so essentially how quickly you are shaking the string up and down, or we could think of it as the number of waves that pass a certain point per unit time. So if I look at this point right here, the frequency would be how many waves pass it, for instance, per second. Now the unit of frequency we've learned before, which is one over seconds, but we often just call that Hertz, and that's abbreviated with a capital H, lowercase z. And ultimately the frequency just depends on how quickly the source is oscillating. The source, what is creating the wave, is ultimately what sets the frequency. 
nothing else. So if you shake your hand really quickly, really high frequency. If you shake your hand slowly, that's going to be a low frequency. Now, on the flip side of frequency, we also have what is known as period, which we abbreviate with a capital T, which is the length of time it takes to generate either one wave or the length of time it takes for one wave to pass a particular position. And the unit would be in seconds. And additionally, this ultimately just depends, once again, on how quickly you're oscillating the source. If you do it quickly, you're going to have a very small period. If you do it slowly, you're going to have a very long period. And one key note to remember is that these two uh, properties are inversely related. Frequency is equal to 1 over period, and period is equal to 1 over frequency. The next property is known as amplitude, which we abbreviate with a capital A, which is the maximum displacement of the medium from its equilibrium position. So if this gray dashed line is equilibrium, it's the distance going from here to the crest or the distance going from here to the trough. And we need to be very, very careful. It is not this. This would actually be two times the amplitude. So we really want to make sure we're looking from a crest to equilibrium or a trough to equilibrium not the two together. Now the unit of this simply will just be in meters and this depends on the energy used to disturb the medium. Now what do I mean by that? Well for instance to get a bigger amplitude I need to move my arm way more up and down than if I had a small amplitude I'd be moving my arm a very small amount up and down. Well if I'm moving my arm up and down I'm applying a force to the string over a relatively large distance back and forth so I'm doing a lot of work on the string, meaning that this wave will carry more energy. Comparatively, if I do a really small, basically shaking it back and forth, I'm doing a force over a much smaller distance, that's gonna be a lot less energy. So amplitude directly correlates with the energy contained in this wave. Now this wave is moving through space. All waves are moving. They are traveling disturbances after all. And we call that the speed at which it moves through space, the wave speed, which we usually abbreviate with a lowercase v. The units are just in meters per second. And this is something that's very interesting here. The speed of the wave actually only depends on the properties of the medium. So for instance, if you have a string, that could be how much tension is in the string, how taut it is. It could be what the string is made out of. It could be how thick it is. Um, if we have a wave moving through air, it could depend on the temperature of the air. It could depend on the density of the air. It could depend on the type of molecules in the air. But a key point here is that if we had an individual object, if we want to know its kinetic energy, well, we would look at how fast it's moving. That is not how waves work. Wave energy does not depend on the velocity. Instead, it depends on that amplitude. The velocity really has no correlation to the energy whatsoever. And this is very, very unusual compared to everything we've seen before. The last property we're going to look at is something known as wavelength, which is the distance between what we call repeating points in a wave. So this could be the distance between a crest and a crest. It could be a distance between a trough and a trough, and you want to be very, very careful. You might think, okay, well, this is equilibrium, then I'm going to go to the next equilibrium position. Oh, that's the wavelength. That's not quite right. If we're looking at equilibrium, we need to make sure that when we come back to it, it's moving in the same direction it was originally. So here we're moving downward and to the right. We get one full wavelength, and once again, we're moving downward and to the right. Now, the units of the wavelength are in meters, and it depends on a few different things. Well, first off, it depends on how quickly we're going to be shaking this back and forth. Because if I'm taking a longer time to shake this back and forth, well, then the wave is going to have more time to stretch out before the next wave is formed. So wavelength directly correlates with the period. Well, because of what we know about period, that means it inversely correlates with the frequency. If I wave the string back and forth really quickly, more waves are going to be created more quickly, so the wavelengths are going to be much, much smaller. Now, what about how quickly the wave is moving? If I shake my hand up and down once, it's going to start going. And then if I shake it up and down again, that's a new wave. Shake it up and down again, that's a new wave. But if the waves are going really, really quick, they're actually going to have more time to stretch out before I generate the next wave. So wavelength is actually directly proportional to the wave speed. We're going to go ahead and combine some of these relations together in what is known as basically the wavelength equation. That the wavelength, which we abbreviate with this Greek letter lambda, that is how we pronounce this as lambda, kind of looks like an upside down 
Why? This Greek letter lambda, the wavelength in meters, is equal to the wave speed in meters per second over the frequency in hertz, or 1 over seconds. So let's look at a brief example. Let's say you're creating waves on the string by shaking it up and down at a rate of 3 hertz, a frequency of 3 hertz, and that the wavelength in these waves is about half meter. Well, how quickly are the waves moving? And additionally, if we double the frequency, how does that change the frequency, the wave speed, and the wavelength? Well, let's first think, okay, well, how can we calculate the speed? Pretty straightforward. We're going to use lambda is equal to v over f, and we're going to rearrange it, solve for v, so v is equal to f lambda. We're going to say 3 hertz times 0 0.5 meters. Okay, we get a wave speed of 1.5 meters per second. That's how quickly they're moving through the string. Pretty easy. Now let's look at, though, if we ch double the frequency, how do these other properties change? Now the first one should be pretty easy. If we were originally moving it at 3 hertz, and now we double the frequency, well now it's going to be 6 hertz. What about the wave speed? Now instinctively, you're probably thinking, okay, well I'm going to stick in 6 hertz here, times 0.5, 6 times 0.5, so this will now be going at 3 meters per second. And that would be wrong, because remember what we said, the wave speed only depends on the properties of the medium. If I shake the string up and down more, that has not changed the properties of this string, so the wave speed's in fact going to be exactly the same. It's going to be 1.5 meters per second. Then lastly, I can calculate a new wavelength, doing V over F, so 1.5 over 6 hertz, and we get a wavelength of 0.25 meters. So wavelength depends on wave speed and frequency. They do not depend on wavelength. We want to make sure we get that right. Lastly, how do we represent waves on a graph? Now, transverse waves are inherently two-dimensional, so there's a couple different ways that these graphs can be constructed, because remember, their molecules are moving perpendicular to the direction that the wave is traveling. So let's first say we were to literally just put an axis over the top of this wave, marking the vertical position of the wave, y in meters, by the horizontal position of the wave in meters going through this space as x. Now, how exactly would we then plot this? Well, it would look exactly like this wave, because this is essentially a position versus position graph, or a y versus x graph, and essentially it's just showing you what the wave looks like at one moment in time. It's as if though you took a camera and took a snapshot at one single instant that the wave is moving. So it's like you basically froze it in place. Well, this is pretty easy to study. We will write the equation like this. That y is a function of x is equal to the amplitude times cosine of 2 pi x over lambda. Now, a couple things here. First off, we're going to leave x and y just like they are. They are variables. They're basically saying if I want to look at this horizontal position right here, I would stick in this horizontal position for x, and it would spin out a vertical position y. So we're just going to leave those as variables so that we can write the equation for this graph. A is the amplitude in meters. Lambda is the wavelength in meters. And the last thing we want to remember, though, is just like we talked about last year when we were looking at simple harmonic motion, this cosine is not the only option you really have. That's really just a placeholder. And we can have positive cosine, negative cosine, positive sine, negative sine. It simply depends on where we are starting at the origin. So if it is positive cosine, it's going to start above the origin. If it's negative cosine, it's going to start below. If it's positive sign, it's basically going to be going upward to the right through the origin. If it's negative sign, it's going to go downward to the right through the origin. So for this particular wave, it's starting below the origin. So I would actually stick in negative cosine rather than positive cosine when I was constructing this equation. But there's another way that we can generate this graph, because keep in mind that this is changing throughout time. So rather than looking at one single instant, what happens if I want to look at a particular position on this medium, so on this string, and how its position changes as time continues? Well, that's not going to be a position versus position graph. We're actually going to be creating a position versus time graph, which in this case we're going to call y versus t because it's moving up and down, you could easily have left it as x versus t. So this is how the position of a single point changes as the wave passes through it, and ultimately, because this is happening at a nice simple periodic rate, 
This is actually an example of simple harmonic motion. That particular point is going to go up and down, oscillating back and forth, just like we learned last year in AP Physics 1. So the equations of that are going to be exactly like those we learned last year. That is vertical position with respect to time is equal to a cosine 2 pi, the frequency times t, or a cosine 2 pi t over the period. Two different ways we could do this. And keeping in mind that this now is not the wavelength, that is not what this is. Instead, that is the period, because we're looking at how this is changing with respect to time, not position. Once again, when we're writing these equations, we would leave TST because it is a variable. And additionally, remember this cosine could be positive cosine, negative cosine, positive sine, negative sine, just like we did for the position versus position graphs. So what are our main takeaways on this first lesson on mechanical waves, looking at types of waves and their properties? Well, one, can we conceptually explain what, really, what a wave is and define mechanical waves in particular, and that they basically require a medium? Can we differentiate between different types of mechanical waves, specifically transverse and longitudinal? Can we identify and or calculate the properties of a wave, so amplitude, frequency, period, wave speed, wavelength, and conceptually explain what each of these depends on? And can we write equations for the graphs of waves, specifically if we have a position versus position graph, like vertical and horizontal, for instance, or a position versus time graph?